Juru Traditional Owners started proceedings officially welcoming participants to the 2014 North Queensland Land Council Land Summit to their country, Clump Mountain near Mission Beach. Here along the Katsumari coast and amongst the beautiful rainforest. I must say that not all of us live here, but we are now taking every chance to come back on country and appreciate our ancestral past and priceless heritage. Since native title determination in 2012, opportunities have arisen for my generation and the next, and so too our grandchildren. Opportunities to engage and continue our connection and hopefully all return to country sometime very soon. Jury wish everyone here and those that will be attending in the following days a very productive land summit, AGM, and that we can together prove and achieve desirable and expected outcomes for all. Thank you for allowing me to speak and welcome. North Queensland Land Council Chairperson Errol Neal then formally opened the summit, the first to be held in six years, with the promise to be a biannual event in the future. I do apologise, Jiru. Um, um, mate, um, this uh, particular area, you know, a lot of bad people uh, came here a lot on a lot of occasions, uh, meeting up and and discussing, uh, you know, talking about issues uh, related to our, you know, our country and and the issues we, you know, we deal with. Um, so this place a lot of a lot of uh, visitors here. Are. One of those finest places in the, in, in, the, in in Sydney in the north um, that you know you feel you can draw some comfort from. Um, and in saying that, um, you know, I like to um, you know first. The summit provided an opportunity for the North Queensland Land Council to consult with traditional owners about issues affecting them, as well as an opportunity to network with Indigenous business and community leaders. This year's summit focused on developing business opportunities as a means to closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The strong agenda and notable key speakers attracted traditional owners from right across the North Queensland Land Council's representative region. Aboriginal activist Marindu Yana facilitated the event which included presenters such as human rights lawyer Dan O'Gorman, anthropologist David Martin and Torres Strait Island Regional Authority Chair Joseph Elu. One of the highlights of the first day was a presentation by Social Justice Commissioner Mick Gooder. He spoke about the latest native title report and issues relating to nation building. Commissioner Gooder's session sparked discussions about constitutional change, sovereignty and the First Nation Assembly. Uh, we're on Juru Country, uh, Mission Beach, um, up here with the North Queensland Land Council uh, at a land summit. Lots of traditional owners coming together for the weekend, talk about a whole lot of issues. Um, mainly, I think, just mob up here having a yarn together. That's, that's the biggest thing. And I'm just talking a little bit about my reports this year, particularly how they relate to native title, but also about... Um, some of the concepts we've been working on um, with a whole lot of other people in the country around nation building and, and an assembly of First Nations. So a whole range of things, um, just giving people some um, uh, idea about my workload, um, but also uh, underlying all that is promoting the concept of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people being in charge of their own destiny. We're now coming to a very strong conclusion that as we get more and more resources from government we lose more and more control and people want Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to control this process. So, so I think going back to those old days where people got through on you know, the, you know, the smell of an oily rag, is, it's not just romantic, it's, it's actually the way we should be doing it, that we're in control of it. And we do lose control when we take money from government. Another highlight of day one was Sean Sexton Moss from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet talking about the new Indigenous Advancement Strategy and the future of Native Title representative bodies and funding arrangements. The presentation by Sean, a Senior Native Title Advisor from the Native Title Funding and Land Management Branch, brought heated discussions and questions from traditional owners. Elwyn Lyle, Cooker Yellenji traditional owner, 
emphasise the issues facing his mob with the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, such as lost opportunities around the funding round and the problems facing smaller organisations when applying for funding. This is what we've said all along, you know. You've got these non-Indigenous organisations putting in for funding to do programs on our country, yet they don't even engage with us in the first instance. They don't incorporate into their how they're going to deliver the programs or nothing. It's just like we're a bunch of animals in the yard and, and these fellows are going to feed and water us, you know. So to me it's, um, yeah, it's the wrong approach once again. And, you know, back in the day when we were talking to the last government, we told them that, you know, through the Caring for Country grant process, anybody, any non-Indigenous organisation that puts in a submission have to tick the box or have to show that they've engaged or consulted with the traditional owners who they're going to deliver the program to so that we've got a heads up on what's going on, you know. And, um, yeah, that sort of um, process needs to be incorporated right across the funding table, you know. Was why, why was the government, you know, tried to get this IAS submission across the table in one month, you know, that for organisations that don't have the resources to go out and employ a consultant to come in and write these submissions for us, it left us, you know, with no other option that, but to um, not put something in and try and work for the next release in January, you know, and um, hopefully by then, with three months up our sleeve, we might have a good opportunity of, of putting together a reasonable submission with the plans to go with it that'll actually, you know, um, help push it across the table, across the floor. An informal session with Sean allowed for greater discussion with prescribed body corporate members about native title and funding possibilities for the future. The afternoon brought further discussions about connection to country with North Queensland Land Council anthropologist Di O'Rourke, top class anthropologist David Martin from Anthropos and human rights lawyer Dan O'Gorman. Wrapping up a busy day one, there was talk around the importance of traditional law, working together as one and potential opportunities from the assembly of First Nations. The day closed with a night performance by the Juru dancers from Clump Point. Traditional owners gathered on day two of the summit to focus on economic development and commercialisation. The summit gave participants the opportunity to openly discuss and raise their concerns with two Queensland government ministers. Assistant Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and Multicultural Affairs, David Kempton, talked about changes underway in Cape York and encouraged discussions throughout Queensland with particular emphasis on the North Queensland Land Council region. Look, I've been really concerned about native title from day one and I've been in the debate since its inception and I've acted right through um, most of the cases in this region and I think the outcomes don't really reflect what's gone into it or the needs of the people and we always try and line it up with sovereign title. Native title is far more to do with people's interaction with the land and ownership of the land and some kind of a title. And I don't think the economic opportunity or even the full potential of that land's even been thought about, yet alone realised. So we have this really strict process of what entitlements are on the land and do you have native title and don't you and do the other interests extinguish it or not or do they coexist? And it's a very confining argument. 
I think as long as there is no extinguishment of native title, we should be operating in a free market situation to negotiate a whole range of options for those traditional owners, from provision of services to the person who occupies the land, to maybe fencing, road building, cattle mustering, or even joint ventures around horticulture and agriculture for the TOs. I think we need to move into a new conversation. The old one's getting a bit tired. We haven't really delivered very much. Ownership of land underpins economic development and social reform. Our economic participation policy is really handing those things that government does badly over to the communities. And there might be a couple of falls along the way, but I'm confident in five years we'll see a whole new landscape right across Queensland, not just the north. So regions like this is a matter of engaging with the traditional owner groups here rather than representative councils because there aren't any and seeing what opportunities are out there. But I'm not about coming and saying, well, we can do this and this for you. I need people to come to us and say, we've got this idea. How can you help us? How can you help us? Happen? Minister for Natural Resources and Mines, Andrew Cripps's presentation opened up discussion around the commercialisation of country and social, cultural and environmental impact. Minister Cripps emphasised his commitment to making positive change and the need for traditional owners to bring a united front to government for a productive way forward. I think that realising the value that you have, the interest that you have in the land, to benefit not only the economic outcomes, but the economic outcomes, if they're positive, can have much better influences on the social, environmental and cultural outcomes that you also get. And that's true in any community that you live in, whether it's Indigenous or non-Indigenous. If you have a good, healthy commercial or an economic outcome, you've got more resources available to use to make sure that the people who should benefit have better social and environmental and cultural outcomes. So I think the secret is to make sure that the interests that Indigenous people have in the land um, are used uh, in the best way possible to realise those benefits socially and environmentally and culturally as well. It's really important for Indigenous people, wherever they are in Australia, but particularly in Queensland where I want to see them go ahead, need to have those conversations amongst themselves and be in agreement about where they want to go. Um, what off, I mean, this is true for, for the wider community as well. Whenever change is proposed, there are people who have a variety of views. That's not just the case for Indigenous communities, it's the, it's the case for all communities. Um, and where you get change for the better, hopefully quicker, is where you can find consensus in the community. So those conversations have got to have amongst Indigenous people themselves, and if they can bring a united front and a united message to, to other decision makers, including the government, I think we'll see much faster change and change for the better quicker. The topic provided great discussion and debate as participants talked about the impediments the current native title system brings for traditional owners working towards economic sustainability to develop greater opportunities for young people and to care for country. Chris Fry, CEO of Indigenous Business Australia, was the first panellist looking at ways to develop business opportunities with particular emphasis on what the IBA does and how. This brought mixed reactions from participants. Some questioned the relevance of commercialisation when it comes to native title and how organisations like IBA need to connect with traditional owners when considering investing or doing business on their homeland. Others were supportive of economic development and while spoke of the problems when creating business, explained how they were helping themselves rather than going to IBA. North Queensland Land Council CEO Ian Kutch and Murundi Yana highlighted some examples of where opportunities are not benefiting traditional owners. Put into further investments that benefit Aboriginal people and people on the ground. Uh, the Holiday Inn in Townsville, mate. Uh, IBA has purchased that. Um, we've got the, you know, two groups in the, in Townsville that, uh, um, you know, would like to be involved there. Um, you know, I understand the model was, uh, you know, you go in partnership with the people uh, in Townsville or the people where the investment is. But I'm not conscious that there's been much. Uh, work done on that area. I know that um, there's you know, employment there now happening and, 
you know, uh, some benefit going back to the community. But we certainly like to see IBA uh, embrace the traditional owners of the Townsville region with that investment. Let me, let me, if IBA invested anywhere in my traditional country without going through us, without giving us a slice of action, I would be absolutely disgusted and put them in a scumbag box as no better than a multinational corporate cutthroat. And that is exactly what CDC, which they had a big bloody cut in, the uh, little thing with did the bulk sampling at Century got the contract years ago and they came out and ripped up half the friggin' thing and made a lot of money. And no black fella better for, from that and uh, they were part of the problem, not the solution. But I, I find it amazing that you can buy the Holiday Inn in Townsville and not have a single black fella in Townsville or group have an allocation or a share in that. What are you? What do you exist for? That's, that's just oh, that's yeah, totally yeah, out of whack. That's a bit critical. No, not no. having a go at you, Chris, is probably the structure, but... You know what I mean? No, Surely there's a black fellow, you can find them everywhere in town. We know, where they, find them. We know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> So, um... Jody Sizer and Gavin Brown from Price Waterhouse Coopers Indigenous Consulting Program and Kath Brockenborough from Lendlease continued the discussions into the lunch break. Day two also provided the opportunity for traditional owners to talk directly to government representatives to explain their situation and what they're going through. It's um, summits like this, you know, when you call to a meeting that you get to speak to all the the relevant bodies from different departments, you know, just air your concerns as well. Speakers make it sound so easy. So um, it's a native title that um, I think is a, a not the first obstacle, so yeah. But um, just ga gathering information from the people who spoke or saying, like, if you want to get into business, it's there. So but you don't need a native title to do business to sell your own your, your um, products here yeah, so and that's a good thing too because you know like with the young people you've got talented people who just don't know which avenue to tap into you know they're just floundering so hopefully we'll take it back and try and get our young people to get more involved sell their artworks and stuff like that you know in order for um aboriginal and torres strait islanders to remain connected to their country that economic development opportunities are going to be a part of that um, to me, it's 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 natural to be able to go ahead. At, you know, it, it allows them to remain focused and, and committed to country and caring for country and doing all of those things alongside, you know, um, making a living for themselves and living in this white man's world as well. We need to be creating a solid basis for our young people to follow in our footsteps. We need to rectify some of the um, disunity, I suppose, between clan members in order to be able to move forward with solid grounding for them. I think that it's hard enough living in these two worlds, let alone having to um, deal with some of the, the cultural issues that we, we, we have that are ongoing between us. Day two closed with a great performance by David Hudson. The last day brought everyone together for the Consider Session, which discussed important national issues to do with recognition, sovereignty and National Assembly of First Nations, led by Walgama traditional owner Sam Bako, Terry O'Shane and Nick Gooda. Mr O'Shane talked about the importance of people identifying who we are and the way that government and colonisation have crippled and disempowered us as a people. Uh, that we're not affected or we, we don't become intellectual cripples because colonisation has actually got us in a, in a mindset where we actually accept what's going on. And, and a good example was given yesterday, I suppose, when Murray jumped up and said, don't worry about not having money. You've got your native title. Use that with a capacity partner to get your contract going. People say, oh, the government hasn't given any resources. We get 50000 lousy dollars. We need, no, you don't need anything at all. You need to identify who you are. And I think that's what Mickey's saying. You know, they don't use the Koori or the, or the Murray anymore. They're starting to identify who they are. Well, that's exactly right. We've got, to, we've got to identify who we are and where we actually stand in this place. We forget about this colonisation process that's crippled us in terms of us thinking outside, uh, outside of the, the accepted process here. And we actually going to start exert out, as, as Mickey said, start exert out who we are. But first and foremost, forget about this way in which they've crippled us and how we think and how we have to uh, you know, abide by particular processes and have to do this and have to do that. What you have to identify is who you are. 
That sparked discussion around the need to take greater lead of the process, the importance of a treaty, and for governments to create pathways so that we can make our own choices. Well, in my opinion, I think we need a treaty. I, need a, I think we've got to finish that reconciliation process that was started by my mother when she gave that report to John Howard, you know? You know, that treaty, with, we're talking about a treaty with all of our mobs, all our different nations. You know, I didn't give up my sovereignty. I'm sure my mum didn't, I'm sure my grandmother didn't, I'm sure my great-grandmother didn't. That's why they removed her for insubordination and immoral conduct, because she was making her own choices. You know? They just, you know, they come under this, under the, yeah, they make their own rules up. This whole law that's written in this country is made up law. You know? They come in, they made it up as they went along, and they're still making it up today. It's like yesterday we talk about recognition, we talk about um, um, with this, one of the ministers here, uh, Andrew Cripps, you know? talking about the native title stuff. I said, well, you know, you're given country, you look at this block of land we're on here now, on Juru country. You know? They've given them the block of land back, but what can they do with this block of land? Give me something that is substantial. And then, then, if there's something happening on my country, let me have some, you know, don't put it all in your coffers, let me have some in our coffers for our mob. From my perspective, um, we can't rely on government money. We've always, we've already been down that track. Yeah, you know, we look at our, our communities and our reserves and, and our old missions, you know? Yarrabah, Wurrubinda, you know, Sherberg, Palm Island. Right, they take them, they remove this as far away from our country so that they want to control us. At the close of events, traditional owners talked about how the summit provided the opportunity for open discussion, not just about issues on a local level, but of national relevance. This is a way of being transparent, um, accountable, sharing the agenda with the native title bodies who have come about as a result of the Land Council's um, uh, responsibility. You know, the Land Council's responsibility is to help the traditional owner groups achieve native title. Um, and so now we've got these 40 odd groups across the Land Council footprint, and a summit like this um, brings the membership and the service body together. Uh, a and little bit more strongly. Well, one of, my, one of the main reasons um, you know, coming along to this summit was that I think it's not just for us to understand what we want to do with our native title, I think it's also for the other side, like the non-Indigenous component too, because I think the key to this is for them to understand what native title is all about as well, not just us understanding what native title is and what we want to do with it. So it's a bit of an eye-opener. It was really good though. Um, got to hear lots of different stories from all the different elders, um, which I really appreciated. It's always good to hear their stories. Um, and also have a chat about sort of advancing and moving forward and how we're going to come together to achieve our, you know, unified goals. Because we all have our individual goals, but at the end of the day, we still work together. You know, it's still a joint effort, I think, in, in getting a message across to the wider community. Traditional owners thank the North Queensland Land Council for an agenda filled with thought-provoking and stimulating discussion and debate and look forward to the next one. They also thanked the Juru people for hosting the event, their hard work and great food. Juru people have hosted us and have been wonderful hosts. Uh, the feed, oh, as always, you, you come away, you go back with a lot more weight. <laughs> you know, so, um, so it's been a really uh, enjoyable uh, land summit and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. A lot of preparation went into all of this here. Uh, the beautiful weather played a big part in this, um, warm days and cool nights. The people that came here, um, a lot of them first timers, haven't been here before and they love the place.